Okay. Welcome back again to everybody. Um, Third now, time. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, today's class number 31, and topic, the famous topic, King David. And we're not going to spend that much time on, it's like, it's a topic everyone knows about, David's King with Bathsheba. I'm teaching the idea of a book, and my title today is David and Bathsheba, is that just a story, or is that a unit? You know, the goal this year is to understand what I mean. Everyone knows the story. I want to relook at that story because to appreciate why the story is there, you have to understand how it's part of a unit and why that unit contributes to the purpose of the book. Okay? I okay, so broke this up. Got my point? We've studied Safer Shmuel so far. We've identified units. Um, and then each unit we attribute to a specific prop, prophet. We'll go over that again in a minute. Then we understand how each unit contributes to the purpose of the book, was to counter all the claims that in the early first temple period that the kingdom of King David is illegitimate, we have to prove that despite all the question marks, God chose David, and it's not coming to tell you all these bad things, it's coming to counter what everyone's saying already anyhow. Okay, so we're going to continue our study today and understand how the story of David and Bathsheba helps understand um, the point of the book and why to re-understand David and Bathsheba you have to understand how it's presented in the book. Hope got my point. If this was simply a book of history, um, you know, here's the story of the Jewish people. So we have a lot of questions about the David and Bathsheba story, but one of many. But when I understand the purpose of the book is not to tell you Jewish history, but to explain that despite all the question marks, God chose David and his dynasty forever. And during the first temple period, I'll go over what we said many times, I'm assuming that that was challenged by the northern kingdom who claims their legitimate uh, kingdom. Hence, Jerusalem is no longer the one place to worship God. And therefore, if Mahmoud David is not legitimized anymore, is not legitimate, therefore Beit Del becomes legitimate. And David now, and Jerusalem is not the final place where the Beit Del has to be. And therefore, Bamot or Mutter, etc. And therefore, we need to counter that. And because there's so much... Um, dirt brought up about David by the Northern Kingdom. I need a book, a prophetic book, saying David was chosen despite all the question marks. In the light of that, I want to read the story of David about Sheva and its unit. Okay. So just a quick review of what we've done so far. Oh, I just prompted, um, someone asked a question. Did we decide why David couldn't build the Beit HaMikdash? I'll just summarize uh, quickly. Is that my point was, David, um, to build the permanent Beit HaMikdash, if it's in there, we didn't push at Shavua, a Mishkan is fine to remember our connection to God. Um, you know, the Jewish people entered a covenant with God at Har Sinai. We need a continuous reminder of that covenantal commitment. We as the people are chosen to serve God, to sanctify His name. We entered a covenant with God. We need, we always need a reminder of our commitment to be God's people. That can be fulfilled by the Mishkan. But we can't go public with that idea until... We're established when people look up to us and we're keeping the Torah properly. So to build a temple is coincides with when we're ready to go public. David thought, David understood up until his time period, we weren't ready to go public because other nations hated us and our borders weren't full and we we're always in trouble and we we're doing idol worship back and forth. In the time of King David, we have our full borders. We got rid of idol worship. We're serving God properly. We're doing Sedeq and Mishpat. We're doing justice and righteousness. And we really want to be God's people. We want to get it right. And David thinks he's reached what we call level 10 and ready now for what Dvarim talks about, Menuchav and Achala, and it's time to build Hamakom HaShev HaShem, the God place it's going to choose, for his name to be known, the Shekin Shemosham. And God answers them, you're in the right direction more than anyone before you, but you're level 9, not level 10. Therefore, you need one more generation. You have to be succeeded by your son. He has to be a man of peace. Other nations have to look up to us. Then we can build the temple. So when God tells David, um, not you, but your son. That was the underlying reason. And when David tells this and commands Shlomo to build a Beit HaMikdash, he wants to make sure that David doesn't continue the ways of his father being a man of war. Because if David, if Shlomo takes over the kingdom and starts military conquest and wants to widen the borders farther and continue more wars, then we won't be able to build the Mikdash because we didn't reach level 10 again. We're still, the nations don't look up to us because we're at war with them. Therefore, David tells his son, I was a man of war, but wars that had to be fought you need to be a man of peace, which fits the theme in Kohelet. There's a time for war and a time for peace. And um, and therefore, David's explanation to why he can't build the Beit HaMikdash Shlomo was based on that background. 
And that's and then and then I showed you at the end of last year was that uh, when David says God told me you're a man of blood, uh, when did God say that to him? So I try to prove that from the story. Actually, we'll see the story in our unit when uh, he gets stoned by Sheva Ben Bichri. And um, I was, yeah, uh, not Sheva Ben Bichri. Um, no, who's the one who stoned him? Shimi Ben Gera. Shimi Ben Gera. Uh, Shimi Ben Gera, yeah. We get Sheva Ben Bichri in chapter 20. Shimi Ben Gera was from Mishpachat Shaul. He's the one who stoned David. And when he gets stoned and his men want to kill him, David tells his men, let him, let him curse me. That's not Shimi talking, that's God talking. And that's how Davi can say, I was an Ishtamim, the God told me I'm an Ishtamim, because you heard that through Shimi. And David understands, I don't only need peace with my enemies to be able to build a Beit HaMikdash. I need peace within the Jewish people. And when there's still strife from the civil war between Yuav and Avner, and between Shaul and David and all their followers, um, that's still another reason why David can't build a Beit HaMikdash. And therefore, he wants to make sure that there's unity in the time of Shlomo, not only peace with the other nations, also unity among the people. And therefore, all the people started civil wars. Um, he's going to put on his hit list that we'll talk about when we get start Sefer Malachim. Okay, that was our quick review. Now we'll get to the unit so far. I want to simply, because it's been several months since we started this, we've identified units, and the first unit was Shmuel the prophet, how just he was, and basically that Shmuel was a bona fide prophet that everyone accepted, from Dan to Beersheva, how we fixed the corruption um, by the sons of Eli, how he's the one who put the Jewish people on the right trajectory, all beginning with uh, the tefillah of Hana. And basically, we recover from the end of the time period of Shoptim where everything's falling apart, and we begin our reform of religious leadership of um, and political leadership, and we finally um, go in the right direction. And that was thanks to Shmuel. But Shmuel um, is going to be the transition that leads to the monarchy. Then, um, the people ask for a monarch, and God says it's a good idea, even though their intentions might not be the greatest. It's the job of the prophet to make sure it goes in the right direction. And then we talk about the request for the king and why God agrees and why Shaul was against and how that explained the background of Sefer Shoftim and how Shmuel was against and God told him to give them the king anyhow. It's your job to make sure they go in the right direction. We start with Shaul's kingdom in chapters 13 and 14. These are all units of Shmuel. And the focus is not so much how great Shaul was, but the focus was why he lost his kingdom. And we can only find out how great he was when we read between the lines that we saw. And because the topic of the book is not all Jewish history, it's in accepting Shaul was an anointed king by a prophet. But despite that, because of his behavior, he lost his kingdom. And that is chosen instead. And the key story where he loses his kingdom is the war against Amalek. And Shmuel's rebuke and Shmuel's punishment, and that's the background to God picking David. Then I claimed that that was the end. These um, these first four units through chapter sixteen were the work of Shmuel or his students. Where starting from chapter seventeen is the prophet God, because God's the prophet who follows David um, as he's running away um, from Shaul. And that whole unit, the end of Shmuel Aleph, is basically David's slow rise to power. And proving that God is behind these events, it's not that David is some tricky character trying to take over the kingdom, but rather everything he does is guided by God, and God's behind these events and allowing him to come into power. Uh, and God continues in the first four chapters of Sefer Sh and Shmuel Bet, with, uh, remember, it's all the same book, the division between the two houses simply uh, from the Septuagint. But the first four chapters is going to be... Um, uh, the reign of Ishbosheth and how slowly the dynasty of Shul falls apart. Uh, finally, chapter 5, we attribute now this to Natan, because Natan's the Navi involved. David becomes king. He wants to build, the, he brings his capital to Yerushalayim, uniting the nation. We spent the last three weeks on this. He brings the Aron. He wants to bring, build a Mikdash. And God says, not you, but your son. And that was our topic the last two weeks. And today's what I want to show you. There's everything to now I think was simple. What I want to show you today is that chapter 9 is not just the next story. Chapter 9 starts a unit where the main topic of the unit is not just David Sin with Bathsheba, it's consequences. And I want to begin this year by showing you why I wanted to identify chapters 9 through 20. It's not a collection of stories, but a unit where everything ties together. Hope that's clear. I'm assuming most people are not aware of that. 
if I'm not mistaken. That was if, seeing chapters five through eight as a unit, I think it's rather easy because it's all good things about David. But being able to identify chapters nine through twenty, I think it will be important. But usually when you study Sefer Shmuel, people don't realize that. Now let me explain a technical reason why and then a thematic reason why. I want to begin with a technical reason called bookends. Um, we're going to find two times in Sefer Shmuel where I have a sort of a summary of David's cabinet and his, uh, basically his kingdom, his cabinet, and his leaders. We saw this already in the end of chapter 8. I'll just review it again. In the end of chapter 8, remember chapters 5 through 8, was all the good things about King David. How he becomes, how everyone finally accepts him. He's accepted as the king over all of Israel. He moves his capital to Yerushalayim after capturing the city. He brings their own to Yerushalayim. And all the things happen on the way. He wants to build a house for God in Yerushalayim. And then he finishes his conquest of the nations around him, donating the money to build the Mikdash in Yerushalayim. At the end of that unit, the end of chapter 8, um, we have David's conquest of Edom. And they're paying taxes to him. And then the summary, by Yosh Hashem et David, B'chashar Allah, very similar to the um, Pasuk before Shura Tayyam in the story of the Exodus. And then the great finale, which we made so much time on, why David's special, David's king over all of Israel, and David does Mishpat and Staka It goes back to the mega theme from Sefer Breshid of why we're chosen to do Mishpat and Staka. And the underlying reason why David's chosen to be the eternal uh, kingdom. Again, I, my claim was that's not the primary topic of the book. That's There's no book that explains that explicitly. But when you study this book, and you study Divrei Yamim, and you study Tilim, and you study Chumash, you begin to realize that must be the underlying reason what makes David special um, over, over Shaul and why God decides that will be the ultimate kingdom that makes it to Shemun It's a Meth David and Yushalayim Mercha, etc. Now, after me this could have been a summary passage by itself, but what do we have next? Um, then we have Yoav was in charge of the army. Yoav, remember, on, he's the general in charge of the army. Yoshafat is the maskir. Maskir is like attorney general, or he, he's a guy in charge. Why say attorney general? Because zichronot or mishpatim, there's judgments. But he's a high official in the government making the big decisions. Um, Sarok and Achituv, they're koanim, running the temple. The sofer, the official scribe of the king, is Soraya. Okay? The Neo ben Yoda and the Kratian Plati, that seems to be an elite army unit that guards the king. Um, the classic... Um, you know, academic understanding is that the king has a guard of people who are not, who are foreigners. And therefore, there's no third of them taking over his government, but they're a, a, a um, I'm going to say maybe mercenaries, but they're a very strong military group, totally dedicated to the king. It could be, but then that's not really critical, but there's no doubt they keep the government, uh, you know, strong. Now, they're the, they're the main army force that, uh, or maybe the police force that keeps the government strong. And B'nai David Kohanim are you. I think this is important. Here Kohanim doesn't mean priests in the temple. Kohanim mean ministers in the government. Remember, like in Mount, nowadays, uh, Sar Machahin, you know, the person in the government representing the kingdom to the people. So when it says B'nai David Kohanim, doesn't mean they were priests in the temple. They were serving ministers in his government. Now, so look at all those positions in the summary. Just jumping to the end of chapter 20, after the revolt of Sheben ben Bikri, that's why the name is in my head from today, um, he finally dies when some wise lady um, you know, cuts off his head and throws it uh, throws it down to Yoav when the city is under siege to save the city. Um, they didn't want innocent civilians being hurt, and she saves the day by getting the uh, person they're looking for, which we had a we wish there was someone like that in Aza helping us out today. You know, saving the city by catching the culprit we're, we're after. But either way, um, so they build a shofar and the revolt's over. Okay, Now, when that's over, what are we told? Yoav, right, is head of the army. Benel ben Yehoda on the Kratian Plati, just like before. Remember, we had Yoav on the army over here and the Kratian Plati. We have Adiram Alamas, that's a new position. He's collecting the uh, either the taxes, either taxes by money or taxes by people. We have Achil Yoshafat the Maskir, who was a Maskir before. Yoshafat, he's the same kind of government. Um, uh, a new sofer, right? 
instead of Sraya, we have a new Sofer. And Tzadok and Yavatar are the Kohanim. And here, who are the Kohanim? Tzadok and Achimelech, Ben Yavatar, the Kohanim. And who's last? And Iran Yari was a Kohen to David. He's a minister. Um, I guess now David's sons had too much trouble. We have other people being ministers for David's government. Okay? Now, the fact that that ends, the fact that I have to repeat his cabinet members and the people running the country shows his closure of a unit. So that's a technical reason. One more technical reason, because chapter 21, we'll see a minute, everything between chapters 9 and 20 seemed logically to be in chronological order. There might be many years in between, but it's going in chronological order. In chapter 21, we start a new unit. Uh, let's see here. Chapter 20 begins as follows. There's a famine in the time of David for three years, year after year. David turns to God and asks what's happening. And God tells David, the famine is, is caused because of what Shaul did to the Givonim. You know, Shaul, Israel made a treaty with the Givonim. Uh, they were living nearby Shaul's kingdom. It seems like Shaul did some terrible things to the local population. Um, and went against the treaty that Amistad made with them from the time of Yeshua. And therefore, God was angry. That's all a topic in itself. We'll get to in a, probably in two weeks or so. But the um, that story logically must have happened a lot earlier, because why would God punish Am Yisrael for something that happened in the time of Shaul, 10, 20 years later into David's kingdom? It would make much more sense that this is something happening early in the reign of King David, uh, early in his reign, um, soon after Shaul's death, but not. Not during, not 10, 20 years later, definitely not after Merit of Shalom. So, because logically chapter 20 begins a new unit, and then everything that continues from there fits into earlier events in the life of King David, we're going to take that unit and attribute it later to the Navi God. That'll be a topic for in a, in a week or two. Um, but again, those are two technical reasons what, what makes by default chapters 9 through 20 a unit. Okay? So, again, the summary at the end. And the fact that chapter 21 begins something that happened much earlier. Now, let's take a quick look and review what's inside the unit, and then we'll have a little discussion. The first thing that happens in chapter 9, we're talking about an act of chesed that David does with Mephivosheth. If we have time, we'll talk about the, the word chesed and, and why that might be the first story. But almost out of nowhere, um, we have a story about David wanting to do chesed with the descendant of the house of Shaul, especially from the son of Yonatan. Yonatan was his best friend, his army buddy. Um, he had a track with that. They promised each other to take care of each other. Um, and after Yonatan died in the Geboa, David wants to do chesed with one of his descendants. And sure enough, he has a descendant who survived because he was crippled. And um, David does chesed with him. And he's a member of his, uh, he sits you know, in his government, he eats by the king's table. Um, you know, Debbie takes good care of him. Now, that could be a standalone story, but I'm going to need that story for an event later on. Anyone know what event we need that for? Later in the unit? Why is the story of Fivoshet important background for what's going to happen later? Anyone know? Because later during the merit of Absalom, he thinks, uh, Siva says Mephibosheth was Yeah, on. that's the question. Is Siva starting a rebellion? I mean, Siva, who's loyal to David, who was, who was um, the person taking care of Mephibosheth. He was the evident of Mephibosheth. But he was like a big shot guy in charge of uh, of Mephibosheth. So Tziva tells David Mephibosheth is part of the rebellion. And there's a big question whether David you know, believes Tziva or loves Mephibosheth. But that story is going to come up after, um, during the rebellion of Shalom. <clears throat> so that'll be background information that we need for later on. Now, chapter 10 First looks like a standalone story, but it's obvious why it's part of our unit, because chapter 10 is going to be the story of the war against Amun. Anyone remember how that war began? It's so typical to this day. Remember how the war began? I mean, try to comfort. The king of Jordan died, right? And he was succeeded by his son. Right? And we had very good ties with the king of Jordan. Right? And we send a diplomatic um, delegation to the Shiva, like to the to the funeral, etc., and to do Nichumim. And the younger generation in Jordan thinks this is a, what do you call it, the Shabbat, the uh, Israel um, undercover police, is really, it's not really a diplomatic mission, we're just spying on them. 
and it starts to put back an incident that leads to a war. Remember, they cut off half their beards and they have to stay in Yericho. But that leads to a, a diplomatic incident and you know that basically misunderstanding of both sides that leads to a terrible war that luckily we won, but at, at great cost. Now, in the middle of that war against Tamon is the story of David and Bathsheba. So chapter 10 is a technical introduction to chapter 11. Now, of course, my whole point will be that chapter 11, the sin of David and Bathsheba, is a central story in this unit, and everything connects to it. But the first two stories are going to be background that lead David and Bathsheba, and everything afterwards will be the consequence of that. Got my point? Chapters 9 and 10 are part of the unit because they're background to understand how the story of David and Bathsheba happens. Everything after chapter 11, after the sin of David and Bathsheba, will be a consequence. So let's see what's going to happen afterwards. Um, where are we? Share chapter back to my share. Okay. Um, chapter 10 is, is um, the diplomatic incident in Rabat Amon that leads to a big war against Amon. Then we have David Sin with Bathsheba. I think everyone knows that story. We might see. Uh, we'll talk about chapter 12 more in detail. Uh, Nathan challenges David with the famous Mashal, which we'll get to. I'm sure everyone knows about it. That the rich guy takes from the poor guy's little lamb. Um, and David says, oh, this guy should be put to death. And um, and then and then Nathan tells David, hey, that's you. It's a made-up story, but you just decided what your what your judgment should be. Remember Ata Ish? You're the you're the man. David accepts what he did was wrong. He he does Shuvah, etc. Again, we'll discuss that all in detail. But in that story, the baby dies, and then David marries Bathsheba. And Shlomo was born. Now, in the meantime, we have the famous Amnon and Tamar story, which everyone skipped when they were in elementary school when they learned it. And therefore, everyone knows that story very well because the teacher said to skip, skip it. Um, but because of that story, um, Tamar was Avshalom's sister. And therefore, Avshalom is not so happy with Amnon. And Amnon, who was the next in line, gets killed by Avshalom and now, the obvi- no, it's obvious, I think it's no chiddush what's happening. If David's punishment is, David said he has, the person should pay four times uh, for a sin, and God told David that, that your punishment will come from within your own house. So sure enough, um, David loses many of his children. He loses the baby. He loses Avshalom. He loses Tamar. Um, he'll lose Amnon. Basically, every story is going to be how David loses another child. But in, and the kingdom, pretty much, for at least for a while. So the Amnon and Tamar story is directly related because um, it's his punishment. But what I want to show you in each story, it's not only that it's related because um, God said your punishment will be from within your own house and, and, your, um, and you said you have to pay four times over for what you did. It's not just a technical punishment. But what David did with Bathsheba is going to be the underlying reason why that story happens. It's not just, it's not unconnected punishment. It's a deeply connected punishment. That's why I want to show you, begin to show you today. We'll do this week and next week. We'll see how that works. Now, um, because Avshalom uh, killed Amnon, David is not happy with Avshalom. Avshalom runs away. Um, back to his, uh, remember, he's the son of... Um, um, <clears throat> from um, from a uh, queen of a different country, um, from Toy, from uh, we'll get to where he's from in a minute. He runs away, but then Yoav wants him back, which he's important for the. He's it was a very popular leader. Therefore, Yo- Yoav takes a, a woman from Koa to convince David to bring up Shalom back, the famous Ishat Koit. That leads to Shalom's rebellion when he finally does come back. There's this love hate relationship between Shalom, the Shalom, and David, which is really interesting. We'll focus later on the beginning of chapter 15. Because of Absalom's rebellion, David has to run away from Yerushalayim. And he basically accepts that fate, but makes very important decisions as he's running away. Then we have the famous story of listening to Achitofel or Hushai and the background to the civil war between David and David's men and Absalom's men. Then we have the war itself where Absalom dies and David's return to power in chapter 19 and the rebellion of Shabbat Bichri in chapter 20. And that ends, and then by the end, David's kingdom is secure again, but went through a heck of a lot. Um, now, basically, after the sin of David and Bathsheba, there was chapters 9 and 10 are the background to what's happening. Chapter 11 is the sin. 
and everything afterwards, notice from chapter 12 and on, are the consequences of WC with Bathsheba. From a prophetic point of view, it's his punishment. But notice, in every story, something really bad happens to David. And some of his children die. And his kingdom is basically troubled. It's finally secured when it's over. At the end of chapter 20, his kingdom is secured again. But we're going to find a prophetic reason and a very political reason um, for how each of these events is a result of what David did with Bathsheba. Okay? Now, that was part number one. You know, that's what we have to go through now. I'll, I'll talk briefly about whether King David sinned or not. Okay? Now, we'll do the mashal just for a minute, and then we'll go back to, um, and briefly bring in the Gemara. So, I'm skipping chapters 9, 10, and 11. Maybe we'll go back to some details then later on. I want to get right just to the story where David um, sets his own fate in the story. Everyone knows what happened with David and Bathsheba. Um, how bad his sin was? Was it halakhically sin? Many people have talked about that. I'll give some summaries later on. I just want to get to first, what was it that Natan told David? Okay. So we have chapter 12 now. I'll just read from the beginning. Hashem et Natan David. Okay. God sends Natan to David. Okay. And, um, okay. Here, Rosh should be like, it means poor. Not Rosh, but Rosh. Usually it's without the Aleph. Um, one rich man, one poor man. Now, in general, the king is running the country, but when there's a case that can't go to the court, or somehow the court can't judge it, you go to the king. The, the king doesn't need the same technicalities in making a judgment, making a mishpat, that the Sanhedrin needs, or that a Jewish court needs. It's called mishpat HaMelech. And therefore, uh, like that's the famous case with Shlomo later on, with the two um, the two women, fighting over that child. So the king had the right to make the final decision based on his intuitions. So because the king hears cases, and he's a man of he does mishpat and staka, so Natan wants to bring a case to the king to make that judgment. Now it's interesting that Natan, who's a Navi, remember? Everyone knows Natan's a Navi, but the Navi isn't, Natan's not supposed to know everything. He's not a prophet knowing the future, knowing everything that happened. His job is to guide the king, but it's interesting that he brings, it's not, he doesn't send someone else to the king. He himself comes to the king and tells him a story and what's the king's opinion. Okay. So the rich man had a lot of sheep, okay? And the poor man didn't have much at all, had one little lamb. Everyone knows the story. Um, and he took care of the lamb, but was like part of the family, the lamb. Um, he ate bread with him, he ate now, um, wouldn't it be enough to say that the lamb, uh, he had just one little lamb and that would be enough? Why are we told about this guy, this man had one little lamb and he lived with the family, grew up with them, um, they bred together, they drank together, they slept together, okay? And it was like a daughter. The, the, and was, what's that alluding to? Does someone tell me if I can catch on? Tamar, that's Tamar and Amnon, or Tamar. Who oh, so you're saying it's, it's it's forecasting what's going to be later with with Tamnon, okay? Yeah. yeah. And could it also be going backwards? It it might be Ori and Bacheva, maybe. Anyway, but there's 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 imagery here of of a a very intimate relationship, right? But that's what the Kipsa. No. Um, isn't that isn't it a metaphor for Uri? I mean, the relationship, even though he was a chiti, yeah. but he was like David's, maybe like most loyal soldier, as it were. Right. Now, I, now, by the way, Asher, you're right. How did you know that Uri is one of David's most loyal soldiers? Uh, I forget. There's a pasuk uh, somewhere I, which indicates list, uh, it. The list is the list is heroes. It, it, yeah, it, later on, when list of his heroes, he's one of he's one of the he's one of his big men. Which means he knows the men, he knows the soldiers, he knows their families. It, was, it, it wasn't a stranger to David. He knew the family well. Now, I um, think I think the word Vayechayeha is a wordplay for Chiti. Oh, that's that's interesting. I because but but there's no tough there. So why, why would why would you put Vayechayeha? Keeping you alive, I think, is important. 
He, the animal. It's the best. No, that, that's like the best word play he could make. Okay, that's it, baby. Okay, it's close. Put it that way. Now, um, right? What's interesting is that this rich man is doing Hakmasasarachim, right? A traveler comes, got it? To the rich guy. And what do you call it? He wants to make him a meal, but he's taking take from his stone, he takes from the poor guy's stone. Now, is that interesting that you're talking about a person who's doing a mitzvah? He's doing Hakmasatorchim. We're doing with other people's money. And he's taking someone else's kebas. Now, I'm sure he thought he did. He probably thought maybe he owned it. He had a reason to take it, whatever it was. But what's interesting is that um, this evil person who stole from this poor guy, he's stealing for the sake of doing a mitzvah. Of Achnas HaTorchim, which is part of Mishpat and Staka. Which I think is it's interesting. In other words, I think it's saying that this person who's... Um, that sometimes when someone does something bad, but other than this one... Um, event that he does uh, evil is one incident. He does evil. His general life is very good. I think it's very similar to David. Got my point? It's, we're not talking about an evil criminal who's spending his whole life doing evil. We're talking about a wealthy man doing hafasa torchim all the time. And and this one time he takes from somebody else. Remember? He's doing it for the orech is coming to see him. Remember, remember the theme of Mishpat and Staka begins with the story of stone and hafasa torchim? There's some there's something here that relates back to no it's something going back to what's good about David and the idea that you could be a great person but the fact you've done great things you can still make mistakes and do something wrong I think that's important uh, between the lines okay now David David when he hears the stories he's really angry and he tells Natan Hi Hashem ki ben mavet haish the person who did this should be put to death now is that the halacha or not. No, that's too harsh. Yeah. Yeah. So so why why is David so angry at the guy? He's, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's the beauty of the story that David is is judging him, I guess, more than Lifnim Shortadin, but it's a dean that wouldn't go to some, to the Beitin. Beitin couldn't put a guy to death for this, correct? Only the king would. Remember that that's why the, the idea of why is Natan coming to the king? Take it to court, right? It's it's Geneva. Learn parsha mishpatim. I took it, but but there's something here that Dafka, the king has to hear about, and what's going to be because only a king could put someone to death for something like that. Okay, okay. And now 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 this Ben Mavet means we should put him to death or he deserves to die. Got my point? When he says Ben Mavet, means I think he means he deserves to. I don't think the king is saying put the guy to death, but he says he deserves to die. Which makes more sense. Okay. Beta kifsa yishalem arbatayim. Is that the halacha? That we read Parsha Mishpatim, isn't it? When you said, remember when Parsha Mishpatim, if, if uh, a cow you take five times, a uh, lamb you take four times? Okay. Um, now, ekev asher asata davar ze ba asher lo chamal. Okay. First of all, why the word ekev? Where's that coming from? From where? Which again was Avram and his Achnas Torim, okay, and Asher Lo Chamal. That's an irony of Shaul who had that's Asher Lo Chamal. That's why Shaul lost his kingdom. Be different. That's why I'm saying when you read a story like that, it's not just oh you did a terrible thing. The wording and he's giving. Natan's giving David enough hints. I call them breadcrumbs that he should figure it out on his own. Of course, Natan beats him to it. David, <laughs> hey, that's you. Okay. And said, I made you rich, not in the sense, not financially, I made you rich. I've been helping you. Because of God, remember the word Anochi is important here. That's not Ani, but Anochi is much stronger than Ani. Um, I'm the one who made you king. Remember, Shaul was unanointed, but I anointed you for king. I saved you from all your enemies. 
Okay. You of all people shouldn't do this, right? But not, and I gave you, I gave you your, you know, I made you wealthy politically. Okay. Um, and you have, you have all the wives you need, remember? You have plenty of women. You have six wives, maybe even 18 according to Chazal. Okay. Um, I gave you, I helped you unite the kingdom. Okay. And and I gave you even more than that. That's kind of a kind of as I learned from the six, like the 18 wives. But Pshad, he still had plenty. Okay. What did you do wrong? It's a, you know, what you do was a chelo Hashem number one, right? You caused Uri to die the war, right? You took his wife and you killed him with someone else as, as your proxy. Now, notice, can, can you begin to see here why Chazal say, technically David didn't sin? It was, what's alluding here that David might not have, that, that it's worse than it sounds? Did, did David kill Oriah? Right. And I'm killed. He ordered his death. What? He ordered him to be killed. He staged it. He staged it. Okay, no, it's, he's, he, he didn't commit murder, but he caught, I mean, technically he didn't commit murder, but thematically he committed murder. You follow? I'm, I'm How gonna, is this different than from what Yehuda did with, with, um, with Yosef? It, it, uh, it, 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 when, you, when you cause somebody to do something, it, it's aren't you responsible for the consequences? It's it's grandma, but it's still different. It, it's not it's not. I'm trying to. I want to show you already in the mashal. There's already a room that that we're treating David more harshly than the actual law should be. Got my point? That was when Chaz, when Chazal said that the psukim are describing that what he did wasn't technically a sin, but we we'll say morally it was a sin, but not technically. But I'm not agreeing with that approach. But I'm saying if 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 we find the commentators an approach. That David really didn't sin. We'll see the Gemara in a minute that everyone talks about. Um, it could be that the Psukim are treating it much harsher than it really was. Rabbi, right been, yeah? Rabbi, what about what we read in Yom Kippur, El Eskera? That the, the yes, with your and his brothers. Yes. So what's the difference here? It's the same thing. And we are still guilty. And we're still paying until today. Ah, okay, so if, if you, okay, I'll, I'll take a quick break on that because it sort of relates to this. I'll explain the question that Chaim's asking and I'll give you a, I'll give you an analogy. I'll explain your question. The Pute and Yom Kippur, um, which some people um, argue, I mean, most people keep that mid um, The The source of that, let me explain. There's the Pute and Yom Kippur that we say in Musaf after the Seder Avodah. Remember, in the Seder Avodah, what do we do? We bring a Seder Lachatat for Kapara on the Jewish people. Agreed? Remember? The, the Korban, the goat of the Kodesh Kodeshim, is a Sir Lachatat. It's a goat. Chatat, and, and it forgives Israel for its sins. Okay. Why do we need, what do we do wrong? Okay, so, that's, that's you know, that's the Sir Lachatat, Sir Lazazel. There's two Sirim, one goes out, one goes in. And the Sir Lazazel is even for, for Stono. You know, it gives us a clean slate. Now, now we on Yom Kippur, but every time the Jewish people bring a korban chatat sibor, remember every Rosh Chodesh, all the holidays, series in Machad chatat, it's always a seir, it's always a goat. And the logical understanding is, is because Yosef's brothers, uh, when they sold him, what did they do as a cover up? Remember by Shchatu series, they took a, a goat, they um, took the blood of the goat, dipped Yosef's coat in blood, sent it to the father. To trick the father to think that he's to blame for the murder, or for the death of, of Yosef, because you shouldn't have sent him on your own. You know, it's, if he got, you know, it's, Yaakov reaches the conclusion because he sees the stained coat that he must have been eaten by a wild animal. The brother said, We never saw him, but look what we found, which means what caused um, Yosef's death. The fact his father sent him all alone on that journey, and, 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 uh, and Yaakov just left things alone. And trusted his sons, and that sent Yosef. The death wouldn't happen. Therefore, they want Yaakov to take the, the blame for what they did, and that's what's so terrible about their sin. Now, after twenty years, they say, "Oh, well, we're guilty." Now, on Yom Kippur, now 
when we read that story in Sefer Breshit, what are we supposed to learn from it? We're supposed to learn the message of Sinat Chinam. Which I don't think Am Yisrael has done in our own generation. I don't think we're getting that. We're not doing such a good job on that. In other words, the brothers are sure they're doing the right thing when they do it. Because Yosef's evil, remember? You know, Yosef's, you know, he's not from the chosen family. Yosef brings Lush and Hara. But they, have, they, have, they can give a whole shirkali where Yosef doesn't belong in the Jewish people. You know, B'nai Leia are chosen. Yosef doesn't belong. We got to get rid of him. We're doing a mitzvah. We're getting rid of him. We should really, we should kill him, but we're doing a favor by keeping him alive. You know, why commit murder? But they're sure they're doing the right thing when they sell him. Or when they want to sell him or when they want to kill him. Remember? Because they're ruining, you know, they have a nevuah of what, they have their understanding of what Am Yisrael is supposed to be. And he doesn't, he's not part of Klai Yisrael. Now, only 20 years later, after all those events, they realized they were to blame for it. Remember, they say, they have regret later on. But this, in my opinion, the stories in Breshit to explain the dangers of Sinat Chinam, of, of, base, of Beis's hatred, which is always good reasons for. Hope you understand where I'm going thematically. It's, 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 it's something we suffer from to this day, which causes, which can destroy a nation when people like are so sure someone else doesn't belong. Um, so in this Sinat Chinam, we're supposed to remember that. Now, if you know the story of the destruction of the Second Temple and definitely the Bar Kokhba revolt, in the eyes of Chazal, what led to the destruction of the Second Temple? Yeah. Sinat Chinam. Remember the famous Gemara in Yoma? Um, and Sinat Chinam is worse than the big three, what the Gemara talks about. Bar Kokhba revolt. What did the rabbis say? Because they were big time they didn't have respect for one another. Now, um, if people are punished, the role is you need to be warned beforehand. So when the Paitan on Yom Kippur tells the story of the ten martyrs, which most of them are from the Bar Kokhba revolt, there's a mixture of you know, exactly who, who, which exactly which rabbis and what time period. Some are from the end of the Second Temple, from the Great Revolt against Rome. Some are most of them from Bar Kokhba revolt. But their understanding is, I mean, the real reason they died was because we went up against superpowers. There was, there was this right wing movement. Oh, our army's so great. We're God's people. The temple can never fall. This is the final redemption. And they can go up against all the superpowers because they're sure God's with them. And they're not deserving of God's help because of the way they're behaving among each other. Now, um, so in the eyes of Chazal, what led, even though politically, what led to our, our destruction was taking on, thinking we can take on the Roman Empire in both cases, and thinking our army strong enough and thinking that God would help us miraculously, even though we don't deserve it, and not realizing how bad their behavior was, and thinking the Sinat Chinam was okay. That's what Chazal was saying. And when in the Paitan on Yom Kippur, that begins the story of the Ten Martyrs, um, it's, I'm, I hope you realize it's a made-up story, that they go to the Roman Emperor and they say, you know, they're reading this story, you know, he, he's reading this Bible, hey, that's a cool story, whatever happened to the brothers, were they ever punished? And then they say, you know, the brothers ever were punished for that. He says, let's punish him now. So it's not that the rabbis did nothing wrong and they get the punishment 2,000 years later for what someone else did earlier, remember? But rather, they're, what, what they're being punished for is for their own sin, but they were warned by the story of Yosef and his brothers. Hope that point's clear? When we bring a ser lachatat, we're supposed to remember the sin of Sinat Chinam. Whenever the tzibor comes together on the holidays, what's the biggest fear? You, you took my seat, you know, you took that, I belong there, etc. We we tend to fight. And we always there's always good reasons for Sinat Chinam. So the Sir Khatan on all the holidays, it makes it to our sitter, doesn't it? It's to remember the story of Yosef and his brothers. Just like the Ayalo last remember the the um you no know, the Akeda story. The, the animals in the Korbanot are thematically important. And therefore, the the when when the when the when the Paitan is saying that the reason for um, um, for the martyrs dying was something that happened thousands of years earlier by the brothers, they're not saying that that these rabbis died because of a sin from two thousand years earlier and they did nothing wrong, but these rabbis died because of sinat chinam in that time period. That's what they say in the Gemara. How does the Paitan say it by connecting? The story of Yosef and his brothers to the to the ten martyrs. Got my point? Now, um, hope that well, I forget who asked the question. 
But that, that's the question. Who's to blame? What was your question in the beginning? There's a reason I got sidetracked on this. My, my, my question was, what David did is very similar to what the brothers did. In what way? I mean, I mean in, in causing... Way he planned it. Yeah. And there was, he, he, there's something different there. Was, huh? Yeah. As far as grandma goes, as far as causing someone else's death, I agree with you. He, he planted as, it. Yeah. As far as underlying sin, it's a different sin. Okay. But he has a part of it. We cannot yeah, remove but, but it from responsibility that. responsibility for causing something, taking responsibility, instead of putting it on somebody else, that for sure is similar. So in, but he at least he said salakti. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he says fatati. Fatati, He says right away. Fatati la he fatati. Yeah. He Yosef, realizes he did wrong. Yosef never clearly forgave his his brothers. Okay, that that that, that we don't know That's for sure. That's an issue. That's another issue. Between the lines of the story of Yosef, all I'm getting in our story, all I'm saying is that if if Chazal are going to um, read between the lines a little bit and say. Maybe what David actually did wasn't so bad, technically. Morally, for sure, it's a disaster. But he has to take moral responsibility for what he did, even though technically he might have been okay. We'll see in a minute how the rabbis uh, get around it. But uh, I, need to, I need to use this to explain what's it doing in the book. So let me finish Let me finish up the main part of the story. Let's see, we're going to have to continue this next week. Oh my gosh, it's very late. Let me check the chat real fast before I go farther. Uh, so fair is like the main scribe of the king. Every king had a scribe. Probably wasn't just someone writing mezuzahs. It was probably writing the official documents, you know, writing the uh, official decisions. Remember in Achashverosh, the Sofer Melech write the, the edicts and things like that. Okay, Asher says like a chief rabbi. No, not chief rabbi. Um, um, Sofer is more of a political position. Um, to the, hit that, okay, that okay. Um, okay, yeah, because other people, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see later on what Noreen's asking. Because someone else has sinned, but with Yoav, we'll see Yoav doesn't do what Debbie tells him to do. We'll deal with that later on. Okay, and it's good pay attention. It's very good. Okay, let's, let's finish up part one today. I'll see if we need this for part two. We can, this will take two weeks. Okay. Um, I just wondered, since you kind of brought up the question about Yosef and his brothers and, and the piyut, I think that piyut is very meaningful today. You know, I think we're in a similar situation where sinat chinam can be the underlying reason for terrible things. Now, um, okay. Now back to Ken, and therefore vatel lot to sur chermi betech adolam. Okay, and therefore by mida kineged mida, there'll be um, a sword in your home forever. Now that's that doesn't mean it has to happen, but it's sort of bound to happen. We'll see why in a minute. Now, why doesn't David lose his kingdom? Because God already swore to David his kingdom is to be forever. That's where olam. Remember, David's break with God. I mean. God's promise to David of his kingdom is a Brit Olam, like a Brit with Am Yisrael. And therefore, the, his kingdom has to be forever, but it doesn't have to be successful forever. We can have trouble all the time. Okay? Again, Ekev again, Kibazita, and you took Ori Chiti as a wife. And you took, took Ori's wife for your wife. Okay. Um, and and therefore, have, yeah. I just saw a little PS. Do you do you hear the irony in Lotasur Cherami Betecha in as a lo yasur shevet me. Ah, very good. I didn't think of that, but that's that's that 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 that's close to a smoking gun. Okay, lo yasur shevet mi udan lo tasur. Okay, I mean, um, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll I I like it. I'll check with my uh, with my neighbors. I'll check with Rav Azak and with uh, you know, the. the I'll see whether Rabbi, how, how, if he whether wouldn't have married Rabbi, if he yeah. would not married Batsheva. What I think it would have been worse. But, yeah, once it happened, once it happened, it's better he married her. Okay. That's All what right. I think. Yeah. Thank I you. I think marrying her afterwards was, was the right thing. Taking her the first time was a mistake. Okay. Okay, I, I have my own take. If I have time, I'll talk. I, my take on what Debbie did wrong is not important. I have my own understanding, but it's not, it's, that's just my own insight, but not not the theme of the book. So I'm not, I don't want to go there. Um but um, again, we'll have to do that next week. I just want to get to the. I want to get to this whole unit as a unit today. Okay. Um, now, David says chatati, and God says, "I accept your 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 sin. You won't die, right? You you might be a ben mother, but you're not going to die. But you're going to pay heavily." Now, 
What I want to get across is that David's sons are not going to die only because of what David did wrong. People are going to die for their own sins. What Absalom did was terrible, and what Amnon did was terrible. And they deserve their punishments, whatever they got. But the underlying reason for their bad behavior begins with David. So there's a there's a there's a chain of events where David's behavior is going to cause a vacuum, we'll see in a minute, that lead to all this trouble. Now, um, the Gemara and Shabbat have to do next week. Remember, everyone says David didn't sin, made a mistake. I'll deal with that another time. Next week we'll do Tilim 551. Um, about David to, to prove that David did sin. David says so, he admits it in Tehillim. Uh, but what he learns from his sins, we'll have to talk about next week. I just want to bring one example um, about why David becomes passive because of his action. Once he did what he did, David can't be the judge that people go to for, for judgment. I'll try to explain what I mean. Once you've done something, everyone knows about what David did. It's no secret. Once he did it, he admits it. Everyone knows what happened. It's on, it's on all the tabloids. Everyone has it's on all the WhatsApp groups. It was, it's, it's no secret. It'll explain a lot of things that happen later on in Malachim as well. Everyone knows the story of David and Bathsheba. And, and he, he admits it and he doesn't hide it. There's no cover up afterwards. It was covered up in the beginning, but afterwards it's, it's public. It's public knowledge. Um, and because of that, you can't come to David for judgment like people used to because you're no longer the man of Mishpat and Staka. Who are you? And if your son Amnon is gonna is gonna rape what he called um you know his sister with Tamar, right? Okay. Amnon get away with it, he's no different than his father. You follow? Daddy did it, I can do it. Daddy did it and didn't lose his position, I can do the same thing. You know, and Amnon's behavior is it, his own fault, but it's influenced by David. That, that, that's the thing now. The worst part is what makes David King and great was the fact he was so um, admired by the people. And the judgment, remember David did Mishpat Staka Lecholamo? Watch what happens. Now, again, I have to make this assumption. Now we can prove it. People came to the king for justice. Now, the idea of trust in your government is so key. It's knowing that knowing that there is a government that you can trust, knowing there's a Supreme Court you can trust, and knowing that things aren't, that, that somewhere, there's someone who can listen to you. And 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 people running your life are trustworthy, be it parents, be it your, your government officials, uh, be it your president, prime minister, whoever it might be. That's key for a, a secure society. The second is lack of trust. Things crumble. I can bring a lot of examples from today. Now, um, what, what I want to suggest is, I want to prove this for what happens in the beginning of chapter 15, which will lead to Absalom's revolt. I'm going to just read the first lines of chapter 15 to prove the point. And we'll go back to all the rest of this next week. Okay. Which means the story in chapter 15 of Absalom's rebellion is related to David Sim with Bathsheba, remember? Okay. Absalom starts a power move, meaning he's got his own little private police force. He's got a special position. You know, he's moving himself up, position himself for taking over. Okay, watch what he does. This is the classic politician. Just what, listen to politicians. Okay, and he was gonna, he wasn't gonna sell sneakers, you know, to to fund his campaign. He didn't get that far yet. But listen what he does. Vishkim <speaking in Hebrew> Avshalom After we get up early, he would stand outside the gates of Jerusalem. Okay. See what we see from here? Everyone who came to the king because he had a quarrel and wanted his case heard by the king, people came to the king for justice that they weren't receiving in the regular court system, either because the court couldn't answer it or didn't know what to do or they felt mistreated by the court. Okay? So people came with their cases to the king, but the king's not hearing. By Quran of Shalom, love. Okay? how he, first he meets them. Bimmer, Mace Iratai, what city are you from? Remember? Oh, what city are you from? Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Tinek. What show do you go to? Etc. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm in one of one of the tribes. Okay. Bimmer Lab Shalom. Tobin. Hey, you got a good point there. You got a good case. The king's not going to listen to you. Got it? I'm a better Rebbe. No, got, got my point? Yes. Yes. You have a really good case there, but believe me. 
you're wasting your time going to the king because he ain't going to listen to you. He's, you know, he's a loser. Got it? Fear my shalom to himself now. Okay? So he's having a mishpat again. Got my point? Okay. Avsham makes it. Now, does he want to, is Avsham's goal doing justice or is Avsham's goal getting into power? Because there's a power struggle among the brothers. Okay. The question is, um, do I want to be popular and hey, you're right, you're right, because I care about justice? Do I care about, am I using a, a, a political reform as a political tool? I mean, I mean, I'm using judicial reform as a, a true care about justice, right? Or am I using judicial reform as a political tool to get into power? No, no analogies to modern day times, just, just by chance. Okay. Okay. When people would come to bow down to him, isn't that a classic politician? Shaking hands. Nowadays you can't kiss, you'll get in trouble, but maybe he kissed the hand. It's okay, like the, what people used to do. Then, I'll show you about the Mishpat, El Amelech, by Ganev of Shalom at Levan Shay Israel. Um, he's a classic politician. Then next week we'll talk about what's the kids are by Mishana. You know, what happened after 40 years? Why 40 years? Because that doesn't count to anything, because David's kingdom is only 33 years in Yerushalayim. But we'll, um, and this is before the end of his kingdom, but that those years will be important. We'll see in a minute. But by whenever today is, I want to show you that because of the sin of um, with Bathsheba, David becomes passive and he can't judge the people. There's a vacuum. Avshalom fills that vacuum. Now, if that vacuum is filled by a good son who really cares about Mishpat and Saka, that's one thing. But when it's filled, the vacuum is filled, the, the vacuum is created because of David's sin with Bathsheba. When it's filled by the wrong son who's filling the vacuum for political reasons, not for justice reasons, that's when it gets out of hand and that's going to lead to merit of Shalom. But what my, my point is, is if I look at all those cases, all the, um, I'm sorry, back to my screen share. If I'm looking at all the stories in this unit, that's the key point I want to get across today, back up, right? Why am I, that this whole unit has to be Natan, and it's trying to show you these are not unrelated events. There's a, th there's a, a thematic connection between David's sins with Bathsheba and all the events that follow. Now, going back to the theme of the book, it's no secret to the people, remember? that David did something wrong with Bathsheba. Now, there's no doubt that in the early time of the Second Temple period, of the first, early after the split kingdom, when the Northern Kingdom came to their legitimacy, and hence Mahmoud David is not legitimate, one of the key points that they're making is how could David be legitimate, number one, for what David did with Bathsheba, and who built that temple in Jerusalem, Shlomo, the son from Bathsheba? Right? That's the weakest point Mahmoud David has. Now, instead of saying it didn't happen, you can't say it didn't happen. The book is going to say the worst possible situation. You follow? Right? Was, our book is going to present it as the most terrible sin possible. But despite, no, it's, I'm, I'm not going to try and say, oh, it really wasn't that bad. I'm not going to do like the Gorn Shabbos does and say it, was, uh, it wasn't so bad. No, it's like read between us. I'm going to admit the worst thing possible. I'm going to say whatever you thought it was, maybe even worse. But despite all that, God forgave him and his kingdom returned. Now, if the, if the point of the book, that would, I'm, I'm trying to get that key point out across, is that when I understand the book, it's not just, oh, here's what happened. But the purpose of the book is to counter the claims of the Northern Kingdom of the illegitimacy of Mahut David. And I need to say, despite everything you heard, he was chosen anyhow, then in the book, I'm going to admit Everything, the worst case scenario of what might have happened. And I'll admit that. But despite all that, the Navi came and said, you keep your kingdom anyhow, but you're going to be punished for it. And he was punished for it. So it's important to see the connection that David, now he did he sin, he was punished. It might, in fact, he might have been punished out of proportion to what he did wrong. Now the punishments, each person got what they deserved. You know, there was reasons for, for every person sinned. But, but David's sin might have caused it. But the fact that we admit David's sin and he received his punishment, but despite all that, he kept his kingdom as opposed to Shaul lost his kingdom. That's countering the claims. That's a, that's a, that's a prophetic counterclaim 
to the lack of legitimacy of Mahut David. And therefore, all this story is so central to the book. Hope that point's clear. I have to clarify again next week. But the key point I want to get across in the share is not just, you know, that, that technically it's a unit. Why is this unit included in the book? When I understand that the purpose of the book is, and that's my point I'm trying to make since the beginning of the whole of the series, I need a book to explain, despite all the dirt on David and all the rumors, and everything the Northern Kingdom saying about how David is, how illegitimate they are, I need a prophetic book saying Mahut David is legitimate despite all the trouble, in spite of all the rumors, and despite what everyone's saying up north. And, and it worked, didn't it? And that yeah. his opponent was a Ganav. That's important. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the critical thing about it. Uh, which opponent? The, the opponent of David Amelech was Avshalom, and he was a Ganav. Yeah, that, that Avshalom was, was no tzaddik himself, but I mean, he 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 stole, um, he stole the kingdom in a sense that he stole the heart. Of yeah, people. he stole the heart, but he was doing it, pretending to be someone just and upright. That's what's bad. That, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's bad thing when you steal things that more of a Gazan than a Ghana. Got my point? That was he. he, he Rabbi, did. though, it, would you think that Av Shalom would have done what he did if David had had had? reacted to the rape of his sister Tamar. David is passive. Not only is he passive with judgment with the kingdom, he's passive with his own family. So David yeah, for is sure. yeah. for that too. Yeah, I, know, I mean, he, he, story, listen, I, about... I, I read a story about, about a guy, I think his name was, was um, Kain. Right? He felt bad. It wasn't fair what happened to him. But when something not fair happens to you, does that give you the right to do something bad to somebody else? Ask a five-year-old, right? He hit me, I get him, you know, it's, he touched my lunchbox, I can punch him. You follow? Now, he wasn't allowed to touch my lunchbox, but the fact that you were wrong by somebody, does that give you the right to do whatever you want to somebody else? That's how kids think. Is it possible that the people thought that what Av Shalom did to Amnon and then taking care of Tamar was actually real justice and that's why they went to him instead of David too? Because for, they for sure. For, okay. for sure, but but I agree with that. That's why he has so much. Why does Avshalom have so many followers? Avshalom's main followers are David's followers from from Hebron. We'll see next week. Hebron is what he got. Is is the heart of David's supporters? It's David's core supporters who are behind Avshalom, because they see Avshalom as a new David. But they see David as David. No, it's, remember, there's David Aleph and David Bet. There's David before this and David after. So David's no longer the hero. Avshalom is a new hero. Absalom is trying to paint himself as a new King David. But but he's not King David because his, his goals are not, you know, it's, he's not really a man of Mishpat and Staka. He, he's using Mishpat as a tool to get to political power. And you see later by his actions that his goal is not, is not, is not, um, you know, he's, he's not his father. But, but he's, he's pretending to be like his father. And that's and that's what that's what makes him dangerous. Now again, we have to see why why God wants Shlomo over. It's, it's going to take us more into Sefer Malachim. What makes Shlomo the next king? And, and why? Uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is, is Ab Shalom is going to bring another civil war on the country. But some people don't mind civil wars if it gives them power. What my point? Uh, uh, what? Yeah. I gig if if if. If if you I'm sorry if if you want to take your argument a little farther is is that why maybe the the Mashiach is called Mashiach Ben Dabi because we need to to further emphasize the legitimacy of David. Well, it could be you're, you're saying what makes David great is not only his no, his great, but also his tshuva. Not not really. Let me give it another thought. We call him the Moshiach Ben David, and I'm saying why the way the reason why I identify him in that way. Because it further emphasizes that Hashem recognizes the 
the legitimacy of David's rule. Uh, it could be, I'll give you a better reason for Mashiach ben David. It's here. It's twice in Yermiel here. Um, is my screen shared or not? I don't think I shared my screen. Mm -hmm. screen. Here we go. In Yermiel 23. That was, that was, the idea of Ben David being doing, and you know, it's a Ben David is a king doing Mishpat and Staka. That, that's over and over again in the Nevin, in Yeshayahu and Yermiel. And I think the, the idea of Ben David more relates to David's behavior than something genetic. So, but that we have to do already. With, it's, I'm way over time. We'll stop here. Um, next week, I'll just continue this. I'll, I'll share the source sheet. I'll have Rabbi Jay send it out. We'll need the same source sheet for next week as well. I need to see the parakentine that Debbie talks about. We have to go back and see the stories that lead up to this. And um, the, the, the team of Chesed we have to go back to. And in the in the chat, there was a very good comment about the Brit Olam, which I think is super important. Um, let me just look. I'll just read the comment real fast. Uh, where's the chat? Chat, chat, chat. How did I find the chat? Everything's so mixed up now. There we go. Um open the chat. I'll read the chat real fast. It says um, the um, someone said about Olam somewhere. Um, I thought I saw something about Olam. Um, again, the question about what appears to be adultery that we'll deal with another maybe next week. Um, and it was a good comment. What happened to it? Um, Lotusur. Okay, I'll do that later. Um, anyway, I thought I thought I saw a comment about the danger of a of a brit olam that that because God promised it forever, now we sort of I would say sort of like stuck with Mahut David, no matter how bad they are. Are you referring to my comment to you directly? Or maybe that's why I didn't see it. Okay. Yeah, so explain, Ruth, what was your question about a Brit Olam? He has, there's a, there's this Brit Olam. This is forever promise. Uh -huh. And it, this is Kiviyachal. God has painted himself into a corner. This low tasur of a low yasur. Ah, he's that's trapped, it, yeah. He's trapped by a forever promise to a flawed family and he can't abandon them because of the promise. Yeah, but now, I, I, stuck I, with. I hope you realize what you just said. <laughs> yeah, because you're able to say what you're saying. Guess what's that parallel to? His brit with Am Yisrael is the same thing. You know, saying he's 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 you know you can't you can't get out of it. But I'm, what you're saying is Yemiel, right? And it's Tidim Aintet. I'm sure Benny. I mean, it has a lot to do with Tidim Aintet, the last American book three, where where how come you broke your, your with David, and 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 God's saying your brit with David can't be broken. But it, but it almost has to be broken. But we're, the breed's there, but it's not working. So what do you do? So that's what God says. I have to punish you more than anyone else to get your wake up call. It's because you're chosen forever, you're way more responsible. We'll see. We'll see. We'll have to do it next week in your meal. But you're. I didn't want to bring that up because that's a little harsh. But it explains a lot of history. It explains a lot of events. It explains a lot of responsibility as well. But you know, it's being being chosen forever. Isn't such a you know it's a big schut, but it's a big responsibility, and can um and you, sometimes when you want to wonder why we get punished harder than everybody else, how come we're suffering so much sometimes? It, it could it could give a it's a harsh explanation, but it's a prophetic one. So now again, what we need to do better that's a different question. But but we we there's no doubt our our history suffers a lot, um almost out of proportion, and the question is what we can do to make it better. That's a, that's a deep question. Okay, we'll stop here. Um, and Rabbi Jish, hopefully, will be here next week. And I'm sure you know what all the shurim are this week, so we don't have to advertise them. They're on the, on the, on the mail. Thank you. Okay, you. have a good week. And we pray for um, better news again this week. And hopefully, we'll come yeah. to some type of peace agreement somehow. Already, have a good week, everybody.